Ladies and gentlemen and brethren, we are live across the UK. Indeed, we are live across the world for this evening's Solomon Live. I'm Brody Swain. I'm the Provincial Communications Officer for the Distinguished Province of uh, Worcestershire. And it's uh, my honour, my, uh, my duty to host these monthly webinars of lively Freemasonry conversation. And um, just remember, you can submit your questions at any time to our very special guest this evening. All you need to do, of course, is to submit your question via the question and answer facility at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. So without any further ado, our Solomon Live this evening is a day in the life of the program master. Therefore, our special guest this evening is most worshipful brother, Peter Lyons. Peter, how the devil are you? How are you? I'm very well so far, Brody. Thank you very uh -huh. much. It'll be absolutely fine. And uh, I think I mentioned when we were talking a few moments ago, we've had a, a lot of interest in this evening's uh, Solomon Live. So uh, we've got lots of people joining us already, many people who will be joining us. So so let's begin. Um, Peter, you joined the Old Lodge in 1972. But what was it that made you join Freemasonry in the first place? It was nothing sort of major that made me join. I just happened as one is in one's youth in a pub one night um, with a lot of cricketing friends. And one of them happened to be wearing an old Etonian tie, which I had not seen him do before, um, and asked him why. And he said he was going to the old Etonian lodge. Um, and so I asked him what was likely to happen there. And he said, well, why not come and find out one night? So I did. <laughs> and the rest is history. Absolutely. And for a lot of people, when they first join Freemasonry, it can be a bit of a slow burn, can't it, uh, for them to understand uh, the, uh, the organisation they've joined. And sometimes, quite often, uh, they get it from the beginning and love it straight away. What was, what was it like for you when you first joined? I think it, was, it wasn't what I was expecting, because I didn't, I didn't really expect anything in particular. Um, there were some extremely nice, helpful fairly elderly people, and I was by far the youngest member of the lodge when I came in, and they could not have been uh, more friendly. I think it's fair to say that I was slightly taken aback by the amount of learning one was going to be expected to do, and when one had seen one or two ceremonies performed pretty well, I'm bound to say I did rather wonder whether I was going to be up to it. And I think if I'd been left on the back benches and not being given a job within a fairly short space of time, and I think I became in a guard within one or two years, um, I think I, I might well have taken fright, but I was given good encouragement and given work to do, and I think perhaps pride took over at that stage and it wasn't going to make a fool of myself. And, um, and a lot of people would like to know, is there any Freemasonry in the, uh, in the family, Peter? I only discovered actually about three or four years ago that my great grandfather was a Freemason and he was uh, past senior grand warden in Hertfordshire uh, many, many years ago because my father was 50 when I was born. My father, my father was born in 1898, so my grandfather was of some age um, and uh, I can't find any other sources um, of, of Freemasonry in the family, no. It's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of people come in because of their family and lots of people find out there's a Masonic connection afterwards. And, um, and one of the things I said we would do during the evening is go to, uh, go to our chat screen. So we'll do that shortly, brethren. So any questions that you have, once again, uh, please do submit them. Um, and a lot of people also, Peter, would like to know what you, uh, what you do in your daytime job or what you used to do, perhaps. Um, if I'm being pompous, um, I say I was a child of surveyor. Actually, I was a humble estate agent, um, but I did qualify as a charter surveyor and um, had 40 odd years as an estate agent um, in the, dealing with property all around the country, residential and agricultural property. And, uh, and being a, um, a very, very prolific Freemason, I think that's the, uh, that's the understatement of the century, isn't it? Um, how did you manage to squeeze your Freemasonry into that busy life and, and of course, uh, and course family? Well, I think one of the, the joys of Freemasonry is things don't get sprung on, on you at the last minute and you know what's in your diary from quite a long way out. Um, and I was lucky enough to control my own diary from a relatively early stage. And provided I had things in the diary far enough ahead, 
it didn't cause any problems. Um, what I did think though was that it was quite important that people knew where I was, and so I never hid that. But um, uh, it did. I there were inevitably the odd clash, but nothing ever too serious as far as I was concerned. And um, I'm looking at uh, one of our first questions off the uh, the chat screen, Peter. Uh, Michael Norton says, how quickly did you go through the chair and did you go through all the offices? Mike, thank you very much indeed for your question. Yes, I went through all the offices uh, and I went into the chair, I suppose, must have been 81, I would think. So, or, but was it earlier than that? Maybe 1980, I ought to know, wasn't I? Um, but what did happen was the person I installed as my successor uh, immediately was posted abroad with his work. And so uh, as IPM, I sat in the chair for an extra year. I wasn't master for two years, but I did act as master for two years, which was very lucky from my point of view, I thought, because uh, it gives you a better chance to get some of the ritual correct. And, and you've had a Masonic career that m many people would dream of. Could you have imagined at that point progressing through the offices and, uh, and leading to the chair. Could you have even imagined that you would uh, eventually become a program master? That's easy, no. <laughs> Did you have any aspirations back then, Peter, or were you just playing it by ear? Absolutely none at all, because I think in your early stages, you don't understand the hierarchy of Freemasonry. Um, I, and of course, in those days, there wasn't the Metropolitan Grand Lodge. It was, London was, was run from Freemasons Hall. In fact, came under the assistant grand master in those days. Um, so, I, I, and I, I barely knew the names of these people. They were on the toast list. I certainly never met any of them. And so absolutely no aspirations whatsoever, no. Well, let's talk about your, um, your journey within the uh, UGLE hierarchy. Was being grand, uh, grand director of ceremonies useful preparation for becoming program master? because I've, uh, I've heard you often described as the best job in all of Freemasonry. Oh, well, it, it is unquestionably the best job, mainly because everybody you come across has to do what you tell them. <laughs> and now as programme master, I just do what I'm told by the Grand Director of Ceremonies. So um, it's easier in many ways. Uh, but actually the best preparation, I was lucky enough to, uh, to be a Deputy Grand Director of Ceremonies in the early 80s. And um, that's a tremendous preparation. You get to meet in that, that office a lot of the senior Masons, not just at Freemasons Hall, but around the, the provinces as well, um, and gives you a very good grounding, I think, and, and is enormous fun meeting an enormous number of really, really nice people. And let's talk about your incredible high office. Um, how do you feel about having such a high profile within the world of Freemasonry? Is it, um, is it a lot of responsibility? Well, yes, I think it is a responsibility, um, not least because I'm representing the Grand Master. And um, it's very important that one's on one's toes the whole time. I think uh, I get very well briefed the whole time. I get um, lots of information of what's going on, not just in our jurisdiction, but around the world in different constitutions. And I, I do visit other Grand Lodges quite often. And I think it's extremely important because as we are the senior Grand Lodge, where it considered to be the Mother Grand Lodge. It's very important that uh, I hopefully present a reasonable image of the United Grand Lodge of England. Absolutely, and, and you do indeed, sir. Um, and let's talk about the, uh, the role of Program Master because we, we've got lots of people who are joining us this evening in this country, all over the world, who perhaps know a little bit, but not exactly what the Program Master's responsibility is when compared to the, the Grand Master. So perhaps you could explain that for us. Well, the, the very name Pro Grand Master indicates that it's for the Grand Master. I have in both write, written word and um, in the verbal word as well, um, been described as Pro Grand Master, which I think is more the Grand Director of Ceremonies probably, but Pro is Latin for for, so I'm for the Grand Master. And if he is not present, I am the Grand Master. If he is present, I don't exist. Simple as that. Oh, so simple as that. And um, and how closely do you work with the Grand Master? Are you, are you good friends? I guess so. Uh, what I'm saying is, Peter, what's he like? Oh, he's fantastic. Um, I think it'd be very pre presumptuous to um, assume one was a friend of the member of the royal family. 
but um, he has to be kept informed of everything that's going on. It would be appalling if something either good or bad appeared in the press about Freemasonry that he didn't already know about. So it's my job to ensure that he is properly briefed on, on anything. Um, and he likes to know what's going on. He is very interested in Freemasonry and an enormous help to those of us giving advice on various aspects. So it would be pretty stupid of us not to keep in, in close touch with him for, all, for lots of very good reasons. And um, what was that first meeting like as Programme Master? Because uh, you'd, you'd already had a wonderful journey uh, through Masonry and the hierarchy of Freemasonry as well. What was that first meeting for you like as Programme Master, Peter? I, are you referring to the first meeting in the chair in Grand Lodge? Yes, yes. yes. Well, bear in mind, I had been Deputy Grand Master for a bit, and it, in many ways, I think that was more daunting because um, I may well be and consider myself to be grossly over-promoted at the moment. But I thought that when I became Deputy Grand Master as well. And when I was installed as Deputy Grand Master by the Grand Master, when I came into the Grand Temple in front of 1,700 people, well, blood turning to ice comes to mind. Um, I think rather more so, funnily enough, than when, when the same thing happened when I became Program Master. Absolutely. I, 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 I just will never be able to imagine what that was like for you. And, and let's talk about the Board of General Purposes. Um, which is where decisions are made within Freemasonry. How do the rulers, our rulers, work alongside the Board of General Purposes? Well, it's, it's actually a, a rather more interesting question that than, you, than you might think, because I think it's a very different relationship now to it, what it has been over a period of time. Um, the rulers are much more involved in the running of Freemasonry, but the, quite properly, the Board of General Purposes is the place where decisions are made, particularly financial decisions, but the running of Freemasonry is, is, is under their jurisdiction. But it would be pretty strange for them not to keep us fully informed. And I talk to the President of the Board on a, certainly on a weekly basis, if not more often than that, sometimes depending what's going on. Um, I like to think we have a very good relationship, as indeed I did with his predecessor, and I think um, in my experience, that the relationship between the board and the rulers over the last 30 years has been really very good indeed. I'm not saying it wasn't before, but I have no knowledge of what happened before. Oh, that's, that's, that's good to hear. Now, well, we'll go back to the uh, chat screen, Peter, if that's OK with you. So thank you ever so much indeed, ladies and gentlemen and brethren, for submitting those. I'll be blunt about it. Uh, we've got the program master with us this evening and there's not a chance in hell that we're going to get through all of these. Uh, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Uh, Nick Drews, thank you for your question. He says, I'm a very new Mason and I've been initiated just before the first of lockdown. If Peter could give one piece of advice to me, what would it be? get involved as quickly as you possibly can in all aspects of Freemasonry, now that we're getting back to hopefully some form of normality. And take the ritual seriously. You'll enjoy it so much more if you have performed your duties in Lodge well. Um, and just occasionally you might even get someone say, well done, who knows. And uh, well, that does happen from time to time. And, uh, and that's, um, that was, it's probably the wrong term to use, but the secret to your success, because you got stuck in really quite early, didn't you, Peter? And uh, and you would advise that, wouldn't you? Um, so usually when one has been raised, when one has gone through the, uh, the third degree, there's that little tap on the shoulder from, from someone, uh, usually in your own lodge, to say, fancy joining this order or fancy joining that order. Um, how important do you think it is that the Royal Arch is that next step after a Freemason travels through the, the third degree? Well, Somewhat naturally, I think it's very important because um, I, I've often likened it to watching a television series of four parts. You're not gonna switch the set off and not watch the fourth part when, when you've seen the first three. And it, it's, I think it's slightly, it com comes into that category. Um, apart from anything else, I think the exaltation ceremony, along with one or two other ceremonies in, in other side orders, um, is one of the best ceremonies in Freemasonry. And it's always remarkable how the candidates, when they've been, um, been through that ceremony, always comment on how they've been taken aback by what has happened when they've taken the blindfold off and, and what they see. 
And I think that's very exciting, um, both just from a watching point of view and when it happens to you as a candidate. Um, I, but I think it is it is right. I mean, funnily enough, I, I, I joined the mark before I joined the Royal Arch, only by a matter of weeks. Um, and it may have been simply because that was how the meetings were in the diary. Um, but I would always encourage people to join the Royal Arch first. And do you have a, a favourite working? Is there a favourite piece of ritual for you? A lot of people have asked me to see where to put that to you, including Kevin Epps. Kevin, thank you for uh, submitting your question. Uh, is, there, is there a favourite piece of ritual that always stands out for you, or certainly one of them? Um, I, I think there, there are three, and for possibly for different reasons. I think the, the, the charge after initiation is, is certainly one of my favourite, simply because it's just if everybody in this world lived their life according to what you're told in that charge, it would be a very much better place. Um, I, I think the mystical lecture in the Royal Arch, I, I love doing. Um, and um, I'm not, I've done it in three forms, the very old form, um, which was a lot longer than it is now, and then the two current forms. Um, and tr trying to do it two weeks in a row in two different forms can be rather confusing. And I think the needle may get stuck on occasions, but um, I, I, I do love doing that. Um, but uh, ritual generally, I do enjoy most of the ritual. Um, and I, 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 as I get older, I'm less inclined to be <laughs> volunteering to learn new stuff, but I don't mind mugging up on the older stuff. And is ritual something you fell in love with from the beginning of your Masonic career from 1972 onwards? Or, or once again, was it something that you, you built up to? Because I know that a lot of people say learning the ritual and then delivering it has given them a lot of confidence. Perhaps they wouldn't have got if they hadn't been a fully Mason. Oh, I entirely agree with that. I, I think I did um, a certain amount of auctioneering during my, my business life. And I think the two were very complementary in that respect. And I, I think it's almost the biggest thing from that I've benefit from Freemasonry is self-confidence. I mean, when I was at school, I couldn't have either learnt or got up and recited a poem. Um, I'd have sort of shrunk into the background. Um, and I think it was, as I said earlier, pride came into it with, with the ritual. And I think in some ways, because there's quite a lot of floor work uh, uh, involved, as well as the wording, it, they sort of give you hints as to what you're going to say next. And you've got a little bit of time as you're walking around the lodge with the candidate to try and remember what you are going to say next. And I think all those thing, things do help, but you, you've got to put the hours in. And the one thing I learned early is it's no good um, thinking you've learned the ritual unless you have recited it out loud to yourself on more than one occasion, several occasions as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it, it, the one thing, I, I don't like people reading ritual, um, mainly because they're not looking at the candidate when they're doing it. Um, and, and there are some people who think that they can make notes and take those into lodge and be looking at the notes at the same time as actually having learnt the ritual. Well, if you haven't learnt the ritual and you've lost your place, you're not going to find it again in a short space of time on some notes. So by far the most impressive way of performing a ceremony is to have learnt it. And I know it, it, it's time consuming, which is why I said in Grand Lodge the other day, there should be no excuse after lockdown of people saying that they haven't had time to, to learn the ritual. They should be word perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's face it, we've had not a great deal else to, uh, to be getting on with during that time. Uh, back to the chat screen. Um, trying to get through as many of these as I can, Brendan, because uh, it's not very often we have the honour of the uh, programme master joining us. Uh, Paul Mincher, this is a really interesting one, actually. He says, hello, sir. Do you ever venture into the provinces and attend normal meetings, i.e. non-ceremonial? Yes, certainly. And I've been known to turn up unannounced on occasion as well. <laughs> In fact, to my grandfather's mother lodge, um, I, I, I managed to set up with a provincial grand master um, a visit without them knowing I was coming, which was, which was fun. <laughs> I've done it two or three times, actually. Um, and I love doing that. And certainly into the provinces, um, for obviously for, for, for bicentenaries and things like that. Um, and then the, the provincial meetings themselves. But the, the, I go to a lot of my own lodges. Um, I go as guests to, to lodges. And as I say, don't be too upset if I turn up unannounced. Please give <laughs> me 
that that would be the most incredible surprise for you, for you to turn up at a meeting. And I think yeah, everybody would be uh, overwhelmed and, and, and attempt to be on the money that night, that's for sure. Now, um, you're in quite a few lodges and chapters and, and other orders as well. Would you say, Peter, you can do too much Freemasonry? Is, is that such a thing? Yes, definitely, without any question at all. And I think sometimes when you get to um, the end of June and you know that not much is going to happen in July and August, um, it's something of a relief. Um, having said that, I think it's also then quite important that come September time, you're looking forward to, to starting again. But nobody should take on things that are going to interfere with their ability to do their job or look after their family, either financially or, or by way of time. So it, 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 it's got to be right for the individual. But yes, you may, can may certainly do too much. So let's talk about the current state of play uh, within Freemason, if that's okay with you, Peter. So how do you think things have changed since you became a Freemason nearly 50 years ago now? There's, there's been lots of changes. So how, would you, how would you describe those? Um, I mean, tremendous changes. And, and from my point of view, I would say all for the good. And the first one that, that came along in my experience was the, 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 the penalty, changing the penalty in the obligations, which was a very major um, part of Freemasonry. And I think it was very beneficial. And Freemasonry was getting a lot of flack from many different sources. Um, a lot of it on, on religious front. And, um, and as we know, uh, from, uh, on the, from the police side as well. Um, but I think what, what one's got to remember is that in 1940, when we were going to be invaded, almost certainly, by Nazi Germany, and we'd seen how they had been treating Freemasons in, in, in Germany, there was an, a, an absolute certainty that everybody went underground. I've never understood why in 1945 that, that wasn't cause for huge celebration, but it seemed that people just stayed underground and kept it like that. And the comment from Freemasons Hall when, when inquiries were made was always no comment. And I think the biggest single change that has rarely happened in Freemasonry is the determination. And really starting, started by the Grand Master back in the, in the 80s, I would say, that we must find a way of being more open. And the then Grand Secretary, Michael Hyam, started that. And um, it has progressed under various different uh, leaders and Grand Secretaries over a period of time. And David Staples is taking it to another level. Um, and uh, uh, long may it continue. And I, I, I think lo lockdown has been appalling for, for, for all of us really, but I think we've learned quite a lot about ourselves. We've improved our internal structures, our internal communications, um, and I don't really have time to think about uh, things like our communication with the press and with the media generally. Uh, and have improved it enormously and will continue to do so. Well, as a provincial communications officer in, uh, in Worcestershire, it's, it's my job to help uh, spread the word of Freemasonry. And I certainly noticed the change in the last few years. We had the uh, Enough is Enough campaign, of course, a few years ago, and we're trying to raise public awareness. And, and I think it was uh, David Staples who mentioned um, during a previous Solomon Live that he, he doesn't get asked as much about the, the handshakes, the trouser leg, the passwords. Have you noticed that as well, Peter? Well, I have. Um, actually, because um, my name appears in, in the press and sort of in court circular or something like that, if I've had a meeting with the Grand Master, a lot of my friends, well, all my friends know what my position is. And it, it started off with quite a lot of mickey taking. And it has now become almost entirely interest in what's been going on, particularly on the charitable side of things. And the, 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 the ability to be a part of an organisation which does so much in the world of charity is just quite remarkable. Oh, it, it really is. And uh, it's something for us to be incredibly proud of, isn't it? Uh, but Peter, if we can just turn our attention to uh, to the pandemic for uh, for a few moments, because uh, it's been a devastating time for the world. It's been a devastating time for this country. And it's, and it's been a really difficult time for Freemasonry. How do you think COVID-19 has affected Freemasonry? Well, it's caused a huge backlog of, of ceremonies to be performed. Um, both whether, whether it's for candidates or installations or, or whatever. I, I think we were quite quick on our feet of changing certain regulations to allow uh, lodges to continue to operate 
um, obviously not in the way we would like, but at least they get to operate with their finances and, and, and continuity of working in as much as the summonses were produced, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, I think um, the center did very well and the provinces did very well keeping all, all that going. Um, as I said earlier, I think that, that a lot of institutions will have benefited from the time they've had to look at their structures and, and things like that. Um, but it, 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 it cannot be good for an organization which um, operates the way we do and has a social life that we have not to be able to meet. And I know Zoom has been around for quite a long time, but I didn't know much about it. And thank goodness we were able to have these Zoom, large Zoom meetings, not obviously tiled lodge meetings, but social meetings. And I know that some lodges have seen some of the members they hadn't actually seen at lodge for, for some time. So th 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 there have been benefits, but the, the, the minuses are way, way outweigh the pluses, obviously. But it's now up to us to ensure that we progress matters as quickly as possible and, and get the large number of candidates that are in the wings involved as quickly as we can. And we've got some very exciting times there ahead, haven't we? With lots of uh, candidates waiting to join. And, uh, and what was it like for you to get back to a, uh, a Masonic meeting, Peter? I, my, my first Masonic meeting was a, uh, was a hall dedication. And it felt quite overwhelming to be there with, with my friends, um, wearing that regalia, and just being, uh, just being with everybody once again. How did that feel for you to get back to Masonic normality, if you will? Well, a huge relief, because actually, um, we had had meetings of Grand Lodge and indeed Grand Chapter during the lockdown, during the latter period when we were allowed to have meetings of, was it, I think, six people. Um, and I can tell you there's something rather weird about opening Grand Lodge with six people or opening Grand Chapter with six people and not being allowed to touch your, the scepters and the opening ceremonies for, the, for, the, for, the, for Grand Chapter and things like that. Um, so relief that we weren't still having to do that. Um, and of course, we had the Jul June quarterly communication at the end of July, when we had three, perhaps 400 people, I think. Um, and, and that was a, a great feeling to be able to see the Grand Temple, some with some people in it anyway, and obviously nowhere near full. But um, And then I've been to quite a few private lodges since, um, and installation of provincial Grand Masters. And it, I, I, I like to think it, I don't feel I've been away for as long as I have been, but um, goodness me, it is a relief to be back. Oh, it is. It's, it's wonderful. Often in life, and I'm certainly not putting you in this, uh, in this category, sir, but often in life we take things for granted and things become normal to us, and, and, and only when they're removed do we appreciate them so much, and, uh, and I think a lot of Freemasons certainly uh, would, would agree with that. And uh, back to the chat screen, if we can, and uh, Diego, please forgive me, I, I won't attempt to... Uh, to pronounce your surname, but what is the most important moment in your Freemason life, Peter? And you've achieved so much. We, we spoke about this earlier, a, a Masonic career that only dreams are made of. What would you say has been the uh, the most important moment in, the, in that career? Well, obviously, uh, night of your initiation has got to be, but beyond that, um, I, I think really the, the night I was, I met the then Grand Director of Ceremonies when he asked me to be one of his deputies. Um, and it was completely out of the blue. I, I, I did. I knew one or two who had fulfilled that role, um, and I, I went, went and saw him for a drink on a Friday night. And he said, "Well, think about it over the weekend and come back to me on Monday." And I rang um, my proposer at Freemason, funnily enough, who knew exactly what what I'd been asked to do. And I did say to him, "You know, it's not ideal time for me. It'd really be better in a couple of years' time." And he made the immortal comment to me, Peter, <laughs> it's not really the sort of job that you choose the timing. So I took that as a reprimand and, and rang the GDC and accepted with alacrity. Absolutely. And uh, you haven't looked back since, have you? Um, now, I've got a, a couple of very serious questions to ask you here, Peter. I'm, I'm, I would like to brace yourself for these. So we're uh, prepared. Have you had a £3.50 pint yet in the, uh, the new Freemasons bar? No, but I have found my way to it. And um, <laughs> Freemasons Hall's changed so much over the last 18 months that I have difficulty finding my way around sometimes. I fully intend to because £3.50 seems to be rather good value. 
It is indeed, isn't it? It's three pound fifty a pint. is a pretty pretty good price anyway, especially in the uh, in the centre of London. And uh, and uh, also, uh, a few people have wanted me to ask you, so um, I will ask. What's your favourite Masonic meal? What's your favourite uh, festive board meal? And what is the meal that makes your heart uh, despair? So despair is when um, I, I get a main course plate with a whole mass of overcooked vegetables. Um, <laughs> I think um, overcooked um, broccoli probably comes top of my list of dislikes nowadays. Um, I, I think the, the, probably the best meal I've ever had was the one we were lucky enough to attend after the tercentenary event at, at the Albert Hall, which was not only was the food excellent, the service was quite extraordinary for that number of people. And I think actually the service it does count for a lot. I mean, the food obviously one wants to be, to be good, but um, if the service is good and friendly, that, that makes up for an awful lot of other things. But I, I've been terribly lucky. I've had some wonderful meals. One of my uh, lodges I'm a member of in Buckinghamshire dines at Leander Club, um, which is always splendid looking over the Thames. And again, the surroundings, uh, as well as the food, are what make that. So lots of lovely memories. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, talking of Freemasons Hall, how important do you think it is for a Mason to visit that, that incredible building? So I, I've lost count how many times I visited Great Green Street. And one of the reasons I enjoy going there so much, and not necessarily for a meeting, is because I get a sense of what Freemasonry is all about uh, just by walking in the building. And it makes me feel incredibly proud. So would you, uh, would you recommend that all Freemasons visit Freemasons Hall for that reason? If they possibly can, it, it, it's a must, yes. And if anybody is in London nowadays, of course, it's a wonderful centre to meet people, but because um, you've got the ability to eat and have a drink and things there, which one never did before. But it is an astonishing building, actually. And um, I, I, I just love the place. And I, 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 oh, when was it? Um, last Thursday, I was in the building and I discovered a new passageway, a new room, which I didn't know existed. <laughs> And I thought I knew knew the whole place. So it, it, it is quite remarkable. And you've got the museum, um, the shop, everything there now, really, to spend a, really quite a long time there. And the, the guided tours of the building are, are quite superb. And if you are a Freemason and you have the opportunity of setting foot in, in the Grand Temple, I, I've never, we had the centenary um, party for the Royal British Legion there last week, which um, they were kind enough to ask me to attend. And um, we had it in the vestibule outside the Grand Temple with the doors open. And I kept saying to people, Would you, have, you, have you been in the Grand Temple? Oh, are we allowed in there? They would say, yes, of course. And I would take them in there and give them a five minutes on um, boring them to tears, no doubt. But um, it is such a wonderful, wonderful place. That the, um, and as I say, you can go around a corner and find something you didn't know existed, which is, um, and, I, and that's not human. <laughs> Um, so it, it, oh yes, you've got to you've got to go there if you possibly can. Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? it, it an absolutely incredible building, and not just in the no, world of Freemasonry. What you may not know is that um, I, I think this 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 figure is right. That um, if you lay all the floors flat across a, a flat area, I believe it comes to some point somewhere between eleven and twelve acres. Oh, so I see. Yep. That's a great fact. I had no idea about that. And um, and, and uh, we'll go back to the chat screen piece if we can. And uh, this is from Antonio. And uh, I mentioned earlier on that we've got people viewing us from all over the world. Therefore, Masonic greetings from Portugal. Peter, how do you see the need to maintain tradition with the necessary adaption to new times? Antonio, thank you very much indeed for, uh, for your message. Well, there's tradition and tradition. Um, some traditions you'll find are very short term. and um, I think they get in the way and what, but um, I love true traditions. Lodges have their own traditions, do things slightly different ways. And as long as they're not causing any problems, I, I think that that's fantastic. Um, but uh, what what is a tradition? It, it, some, as I say, some of them are so short term as are proved if you look back in, in Lodges minutes. Um, and they look very, very many of them have come out of a, a mistake that's been made. And the director of ceremonies at the time thought it better be we continued with, so he didn't look stupid or something. But um, I, 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 the right traditions, I'm all for, but don't let's get too pedantic about them. 
And uh, and the the um, the question from Antonio has kind of prompted this to uh, to get into my head of, as well. Uh, due to your Freemasonry, you've travelled all over the world, and uh, I'm sure you'll agree it's been a privilege and an honour for you to do that. Is there one meeting that really stands out, or should I uh, should I change that to? Uh, is there a, a meeting out of many that really stands out from your travels abroad? Well, I should say a meeting of the Grand Lodge of Portugal, shouldn't I, really? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure that's right. Um, oh, goodness me, there have been so many. One of the highlights of, of, of anyone's year who does who's able to go to these meet things is um, the, the Grand Lodge of France's um, annual convocation in December, when they will have a lot of people there. Um, and they probably have 50, 60 visiting Grand Masters or whatever. Um, and in fact, I, I, possibly the biggest privilege I've had in that respect was, um, where, you may remember going back a bit, there were problems with the GLNF um, and we had to with, withdraw recognition. And really and largely thanks to UGLE and our um, friends, well certainly the Home Grand Lodges and other friends in Europe, we managed to get that sorted out. But it did mean that their new Grand Master got installed, but when he came to be reinstalled on his re-election, there was no past Grand Master to carry out the job. So they very kindly asked me to install their Grand Master. Um, and, and that was, a, that was a great privilege and a marvellous occasion as far as I was concerned. So I, I, I think you could probably write a book of your uh, Masonic experiences over the last uh, nearly 50 years of, uh, of, of Freemasonry, that's for sure. Uh, can, I just, uh, Brody, can I just make one thing clear on that? Um, I did offer to do it in French, um, but, but their, their, their Grand Master said to me he'd heard my French and thought it'd be better in English. <laughs> it, was probably, it was probably good, uh, good advice. Um, Andrew's, been, uh, Andrew's been in touch and he says, we are very lucky to have his Royal Highness, Duke of Kent, as Grand Master, hopefully for a long time to come. And I believe you meet him on a, uh, on a regular basis. Do you see the royal family maintaining links with the craft in the future? And I, 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 uh, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Peter, am I right in assuming that since the beginning of Masonry, 70% of the royal family or 70% of the time, that's been the case? I think it, it, it's close to that, if, yes. Um, ever hopeful was all I would say. Um, you know, it would be very, very nice if, if it can continue. Um, uh, having His Royal Highness as our Grand Master is an enormous benefit to us. Um, I think any charitable organisation with a royal patron has great advantages anyway. Uh, and whilst the, um, uh, um, the, the MCF is, is not the Royal Masonic Charitable Foundation, um, it nonetheless has the Grand Master as its patron and that, that's a huge benefit. And I, I know that we're much respected or, and as a Grand Lodge as much because of our Grand Master as anything else. So. I dearly hope that that will be the case. Now, we, uh, we had our 300th anniversary celebration back in uh, 2017, including the, the incredible events at Royal Albert Hall, which many people will, uh, will no doubt with us this evening would have attended that. But what was it like for you, sir, to be part of such a wonderful occasion? Yeah, quite extraordinary. Um, I, we had a, a rehearsal for uh, the Masonic bit, whether you recall, when the Grand Master had taken throne, and we had Derek Jacobi uh, as, as the principal actor, and, and we, we'd, we'd had a run through in Freemasons Hall, we'd set it, set it up so that it would work. Um, and um, the Grand Master said to me afterwards, um, what's happening during the early part of the, of the, of the meeting? And I said, I, I'm afraid so, I have absolutely no idea. No one had told me or him what was gonna happen. And he, he said to me afterwards, wasn't it so much better not knowing what was gonna happen? And he's absolutely right. It was such a one-off, so unexpected and so brilliantly done. Um, that, um, and the, the, the atmosphere with the overseas grandmasters who come, and I still get people saying to me, what a fantastic time that was. The only person I think who was upset by it all was the, the grandmaster of Ireland, my special brother, Dougie Gray, who was a great friend of mine, a great chap. Um, and um, he said, I'm not at all pleased with this because we're the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, follow that. 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, Mitch Bryan has, has been in touch with us, a very familiar name to many people who are perhaps joining us this evening. Mitch, looking forward to meeting you one day. And he says, how important are young Masons, especially young Masons clubs, Freemason? Now, I'm the chairman of my uh, young Masons club, uh, new and young Masons club, which is in Worcestershire called the Cubic Club. So uh, I know how, how important it is to work uh, to Worcestershire. But how important is it to uh, the, the future of Freemasonry, Peter? Well, I, I would have thought very important um as you might imagine i've never been involved in one um i'm going up to talk to the harfordshire light blue club um in, in next month uh, um later in the month um but it's got to be a good thing hasn't it you've got to talk, get meetings of like-minded people of the same same not necessarily same vintage but same experience of freemasonry um and go, only good can come out of it they can they can um raise questions with each other. They know where to go to find the answers if they if they don't know them themselves. Um, and I know that the provincial hierarchies are extremely good at keeping in touch with them all, um, as is the case in London as well. So surely it can only be a great benefit. Absolutely, here, here. Um, Peter, time is drawing to a close. Uh, as always, with every Solomon Live we do, they seem to be gone in the, the blink of an eye. So uh, just two more questions, if that's okay. So what is it that keeps you inspired and still loving Freemasonry after, after nearly 50 years? I've no idea. <laughs> Waking up in the morning and thinking, thank goodness I'm a Freemason, I suppose. Um, I mean, I, 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 it's, it does, it makes you look forward to the, the next month because something's going to happen. I mean, it just reminds me of something back in 90, Eight, eight, was it 89, 1991, when financial circumstances in um, the country were awful. And my business was in a terrible state. And it was when I was on the board of Grand Stewards of 91, 92, to whose dinner I'm going to tomorrow night, our reunion dinner, incidentally. Um, the, and I remember that, that being a member of that board and the camaraderie we had really kept me going and lodge meetings generally knowing perfectly well that you were going to be with people who were in exactly the same boat as you were. Um, and uh, it was just looking forward to those Masonic meetings it, to a large extent, kept me going through those, those pretty dire times. Oh, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and the final question, Peter, and we, we could carry on all night. We've got so many uh, that have come from the chat screen and, um, and uh, many more that I could ask you, but is there anything else you would like to achieve in your Masonic career, is is there anything that you can you can achieve in your Masonic career? Oh, well, I, I can't be promoted any further. Put it like that. <laughs> um, so, um, in, in that respect, not. But I, I just I, I, the most important thing I've got to do is hand over when I give up to the right person, which will happen, um, and then keep out of the way. And are you looking forward to that time, Peter, or, or dreading it? Certainly not dreading it. Um, I've done long enough. I, I've always said when the Grand Actor Ceremonies, I did nine years. And during my, uh, I, 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 I wanted to do that ninth year, but halfway through it, I suddenly realised I was taking too much for granted and was turning up not without having been preparing myself properly for it. And the job deserved better than that. I hope I'm not doing that as programme master. But there comes a time when um, it, it, you, one knows when it's the right time to hand over. Um, and um, as and when, I shall know when the time is right. So it's been, uh, it's been an honor to talk to you uh, this evening. It really has. And uh, I, I should imagine that uh, many people and many uh, brethren uh, would uh, agree with what I'm about to say, but thank you ever so much indeed on behalf of us all for the work that you have done for the Freemasons. Well, no, thank you, Brady, and, and not just for, for tonight, but all the Solomon interviews that you've done, because they are, uh, I think, they've been very, very interesting, particularly with the non-Mason. I thought it was very brave, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed that interview, I have to say. Oh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, have you enjoyed tonight? I think I can say that I have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> As I said to you before we went live, if you've enjoyed it, that's the... Uh, that's job done for me. Uh, Peter, sir, thank you ever so much indeed for, uh, for joining us on this evening Solomon Live. And uh, brethren, ladies and gentlemen, the next Solomon Live will be on the 26th of October and feature the Grand Master of the Order of Women 
Freemasons, one not to be missed once again. So that's 7.30 on Tuesday, the 26th of October. Put that in your diary, but believe it or not, we're not going to let you forget that date. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure you register for Solomon, solomon.ujelly.org.uk for the papers and videos and your central daily advancement in Masonic knowledge. Until then, ladies and gentlemen and brethren, have a wonderful evening and we'll see you back here in the future.